Welcome to this week's program. We're going to look at the war on grass scrubs and how far are working very hard to give you as many weapons as you can possibly have. Also, we're going to look back at some of the stories we've done because it, once again it's winter and it's nice to be able to look back and see some of the fun things that On The Land has shown you. But in just a moment or two, it's Nick Pike and Far. Nick, very busy times for Foundation for Arable Research. Yes, we are busy at the moment, Rob. We've got a referendum of the growers right now and we're hoping the vote growers are going to get out there and vote and hopefully vote for FAR, obviously. So that means that I've had a number of meetings around the country with farmers to make sure they're up to date with what we're doing and also trying to make sure they've got the latest information to prepare for next year. Now, you wouldn't want people to be complacent and not get out there and vote. Yes, it is really important that the farmers vote, even if they may think that uh, we're going to get through with the vote because we need a certain percentage of the farmers to vote to show to the minister that we've got good support. It's interesting that you are blindly independent. Yes, we're lucky in that we only have one mandate which is research and extension and getting information out to farmers. So we don't get involved in policy and lobbying regional governments or national government and that means that we sometimes get asked to do things and provide information to those parties as well because it's seen as independent. That leads us really to the burning issue. Yes, so stubble burning is, is a really key issue for our farmers and it's a, it's a very useful tool in managing the stubble but also managing pests and diseases and reducing herbicides and insecticide usage. And the ECAN asked if we'd become involved in doing a review of burning to provide good quality independent scientific information which helped them in their decision making and as a result, or partly as a result of that, the Air Quality Plan allows our farmers to continue to burn stubbles in most areas in Canterbury. Lots of projects on Nick? Yes we have a broad range of projects, I think we've got over 70 projects on the go at any one time in most years. But there's been a huge, huge shift in the sorts of things that we do. So when far started 20 odd years ago, we're mostly involved in trying to improve productivity. So trials around disease control, cultivars, that sort of thing. And over time there's been a shift so that we became more involved in research which is going to deliver the environmental outcomes, the knowledge farmers need to reduce nitrogen leaching or to improve water usage. And more recently we've become involved in work around farm systems and more recently again work around new products and, and new opportunities for farming. So a broad range of things and constantly shifting as well. I guess we've come a long, long way from Hilgendorf wheat. Yes, we have come a long way from Hilgendorf. We've got a lot of new varieties in wheat coming through obviously at any one time and the biggest shift was when we moved from spring sown wheats to autumn sown wheats and used a lot of the European plant material to increase our yields. So wheat yields have more than doubled over the last 20 years and we're seeing similar increases with ryegrass through use of modus, nitrogen management, closing times, those sorts of things, so more than doubling of yields. And a lot of that comes back to the research we've been involved in but also the research that other parties are doing. Going forward, I think where the real challenge is, Rob, we're looking at trying to make sure that we're utilising the soil and the water most effectively as we can within the Canterbury Plains. And I think we've got to have a rethink of our farming systems so that we move from having dairy farms, cropping farms, sheep and beef farms to having farms and using the land within the farm most effectively for the outcome that we need. We've also got to look at and say what are our key skills, benefits. And we've got some really great farmers out there. We've also got a climate which allows us to grow a wide range of things. And we've got soil and we've got water and there's not many places in the world where you can put all those four together to grow things. So we've got to think about what it is that we grow. And I think going forward we're going to see quite a shift so that we're growing products that we don't take the water off out of before we send them offshore. Products that are used to make some of the new food products that we're seeing coming onto the market, whether it's proteins or whether it's nutritional beverages. And our farmers need to look and, and see how they're going to be involved in that going forward. That's not going to happen overnight, obviously, and we're going to need research to help get there. We're also going to need to look at the business models that are in place, 
how farmers have more involvement in the, in the value chain to ensure that they can get more economic benefit from these new ways of farming than what they do now. The interesting thing is that the modern arable farmer basically runs the farm from a cell phone as a type of computer. Oh, we have come a long way, and yes, the, the cell phone and, and the things you can do with your cell phone are just incredible, whether it's controlling the irrigator or whether it's recording all your farm inputs and paddock inputs through something like production-wise, which we've got out there for our farmers. And with looking at where we take that sort of technology, what is it we're going to do with it going forward? How are we going to use the software within your cell phone to manage the biosecurity at your farm border? Not at, the, not at our country border, the most important border for a farmer is the farm border. So is there some sort of e-fence that can be on your cell phone so when I go onto your farm it alerts you that somebody who shouldn't be there is there so you can manage the biosecurity more effectively. So these are the sorts of things we've got to look at going forward. We've also got to think about how we get the sort of technology that can be captured, the data that can be captured from the tractor, from the GPS systems, so that we can look at it on our phone and make sense of it and, and help it to make decisions. How do we compare as far as R&D is concerned with the rest of the world? Well, I think that we're, we're fortunate in that we have good involvement by our sectors in the R&D and so we have very close contact with our farmers and the other sectors do so we have that, that sort of linkage going very well. The agricultural investment in R&D is very very significant because the time frames to get an outcome are very long so we might be 15 years from when we start a project until when something can be put in place on the farm by the farmer. Whereas Sony, for example, might be 12 months from when they start a project till they've got a, got a new product on the shelf. And we've got to realise there's an awful lot of money tied up with R&D, and that's the same internationally as well in the agricultural sectors. One of the countries I'm, I'm fairly familiar with what they're doing is in the UK, and there each of the individual sectors has now come together into a larger organisation, the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board. And so the dairy industry, the, the sheep industry, the arable industry and the horticultural industry are all under the one banner. And that means that, that there's um, some savings and obviously the overheads, but it also means that across that you can have particular skills applied. So somebody that's got really good skills in the environment can apply those to dairying or to, to arable. And I think there's some real merits in those sorts of those sorts of systems and that's something maybe we need to be thinking about how do we do it more cost effectively and with better outcomes for the farmers in New Zealand as well. Now I think it's fair to say you've got a very sharp pencil. Yes we do have a very sharp pencil. We don't, we don't have a huge amount of money to invest in R&D and research is expensive so we have to be very very careful about not only what projects we invest in but also how we get the best outcomes out to the farmers. And we've got a number of ways that we try and make sure we do deliver the outcomes really well. And one of the changes we made a number of years ago was to involve our team in doing some of the research. So they're not involved in all projects, but in many of the projects, some of our team will be doing some of the research. We don't have the high powered science capability within FAR, but we have the ability to be involved in doing field measurements and that sort of thing. And that has, three benefits as I see it for our, our farmers. The first one is that because we're involved, we can be sure that the research that's done is really high quality research. And our guys are out there so they see if things are going wrong and things aren't done on time and so on. The second reason is that when we go out there to deliver the information to farmers, the guys know what they're talking about. The team have been there, they've been involved, they can go and they can talk to the farmers and they can answer the questions. And the third one, which is a minor one, but which is what we started this conversation from, is that we have significant cost savings from that because our overheads are fairly low and we certainly can operate more cost effectively in that sort of research than some of the CRIs or universities. You must be very proud of your staff. Oh, I've got a great team. They're, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, they understand what's needed with the research but they also understand what the farmers are asking of, of them and, and are working closely with the farmers as well. You're not dealing with straight East Frisians? No, no, we initially thought we were going to and we brought 
um, probably the only East Region cross sheep I've seen for sale in Christchurch. There were Pole Dorset East Region cross sheep, um, cast for age. So we bought them as our nucleus flock about five years ago. And we did buy an East Region ram put over them, but we quickly became aware that the, the pinkness of the East Region Pole Dorset Pole Dorset was a, a liability in this climate. They got uh, melanomas, skin cancers on the older ewes was becoming apparent, and that spread to udders and eyes and things like that. So we realised we needed to get a darker breed of sheep that wouldn't impact on product, on negatively impact on productivity, but also impact on um, getting a darker skin pigment. So we initially went to an Awasi. We got one from the Endangered Species Farm and um, used him over the flock. He has, as all of us, most of us do anyway that I'm aware of, has very bad feet. So we got enough genetics out of him to get an infusion through the flock, and that did darken them up, but the feet issue was an issue. Miles King, who's got a breed in the Warrapa, which has just been registered as a new breed called Dairy Mead, which is basically an East Region-based breed, but with an infusion of New Zealand genetics, we went to Miles and got two black rams a few years ago, three years ago now, and so we're now in the process of converting our whole flock to a black flock with an infusion of a Wasi and these black, and black East Region. So at the moment, I suppose a quarter of the flock may be black, we're moving towards black. Give it five years, I'd say, and the whole flock will be black. We're getting enough ewe lambs now that are black to make all our replacements. Black. Are they good eating? They are. There's no, no difference between an East Frisian meat and a, and a meat breed, basically. If you were going for, especially when they get more mature, if you're going for a, a good confirmation of an animal, you would say the East Frisian's got deficiencies. It's, it is a leaner, leaner animal, longer leaner animal, but certainly at the prime lamb stage, um, they're nice, round, plump lambs, they finish early, they grow fast and they're as tender as any other sheep. Um, but just as they get older, they get that longer, leaner, leaner body. A bit like comparing a, a Frisian cow to an to a Angus cow as they get older. But when they're young, they're nice, plump and round. And, and, and we, we've had no negative feedback from selling our coal lambs through the sale yards. We've, we've actually topped the sale yards um, on occasion when, when we've sold them up there so at Colgate. So, yeah, we don't have any problems with them being treated as a meat, a dual, well, a triple purpose animal. Meat, wool and, and milk. Meat, the wool part's a pretty minor part of the whole equation now that it is probably for most, most um, sheep farmers. Now you've dedicated a lot of time and money into it, but do you think there's a future for milking sheep in New Zealand? Oh, I think it is. Um, Keith Nalan, who's the principal of what's now Antari Egg, was um, Blue River. He said he felt New Zealand could support five million dairy sheep. And it was probably a figure he plucked out of the air, but it was, prob but it was based upon what he knew of the market overseas and it was mainly into Taiwan at that stage, I believe. But um, New Zealand's probably the anomaly in that we don't have a culture of, of using sheep milk as part of our diet. Most other countries embrace sheep dairy products really well. New Zealand's the anomaly, not the other way around. And so being an export country, I think we have a really good um, potential to, to move product offshore. And there's a whole lot of things that are occurring now that um, enhance that. Just straight economics of sheep farming. Sheep farming needs something else to make it more viable. Lamb, lamb prices are plateauing at where they are now, and it's basically at the vagaries of the dollar, whether they're good or bad. Um, so you've got that making sheep farmers looking for alternatives. You've got all the issues around nitrate leaching, particularly here in, Can in Canterbury in the Selwyn district. Sheep dairy farming has a major issue with nitrate leaching. Our farm environmental plan throughout here is four kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. ECAN want all farmers eventually to be 15 kilograms or lower. Most dairy farms are probably sitting around 35 kilograms. So there's a lot of movement to occur within the dairy industry to come down to reduce that nitrate. The sheep dairy industry 
depending on what system you adopt, is already right down at the bottom level. So there's a whole lot of environmental issues that, that favour sheep dairy. Economically, it really stacks up. Um, internationally, they seem to be finding really good markets for it. That's all the word we're getting back. The bit we're lacking here in Canterbury is the lack of a, a processor of size that can take the volume to get it offshore, because the domestic market can only cope with so much, be it ice cream, yoghurt or cheese. You know, there's a limited outlet there. And it would hit that ceiling pretty quickly, I think. But once we can get into a decent export regime, I think it will go ahead streets and bounds. Beef breeding, you're into the limousines. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, coming from the UK, limousin is the, is the main breed of, of beef cattle. So it's, it's just ingrained in me. Um, a lot of people in New Zealand have got the negative um, connotation still with limousin, which is a shame because they've come on hugely and um, docility has been a big factor that they've worked on. But I'm a firm, firm fan of limousin, um, always have been, uh, won't change that. They, they sell well in the market. Um, we've had some very good prices at Canterbury Park when we've taken a few in there. Again though, we've just got small numbers. Um, we, we had a, a, a reasonable sort of herd up in Marlborough, but um, they weren't pedigree. Um, so what we've decided is just to, we've whittled those out and we're, we're as we said, like with the whole time, we're just starting again and being very choosy where we get our genetics from. Trying to get a quiet one's a bit of a problem. It is, it is, yeah. It, all jokes aside, there, there was um, some big issues and some of the original cattle that we had were, um, they were far from docile. Um, but like I say, the, the progress that's been made recently and the genetics that are being brought in, um, docility is a huge factor now. And I would actually challenge um, some of the other breeders um, of, of some of the more traditional breeds to say that some of our genetics are as good, if not more docile. That really is going to be a hard hill to climb though, isn't it? It is. It's, it's one of those things. Um, it takes a long time to get a stigma. Off of, a, off of a breed um, but what's been really encouraging is um, having been present at some of the recent limousine conferences um, we've had external speakers coming in um, people that, that are in, based in the beef industry as general and having involved with other other breeds and um, their comments are very positive very positive they're actually saying that, that as a breed we're making huge progress and the docility and the temperament of the cattle is second to none how do the new zealand cattle compare to the uk yeah, it's, it's a numbers thing. Um, Limousin is, is still relatively small numbers, um, but it's, it's improving. So yeah, we haven't got that depth over here, obviously. The, the depth of breeding that, that we have in the UK for, for, for the Limousin cattle is huge. It's, it's like, you know, if you go to an Angus sale over here, you've got that tremendous depth, um, generations and generations of breeders. Um, it's coming, and, but the beauty now is that we're, we've got access to overseas semen, so there's nothing stopping us bringing those good genetics in. But it's just making sure that the, working with the um, AI companies to make sure that they are breeding in the genetics, bringing in the genetics that we, we need. Do you see them being used as a terminal sire? Um, the, the, They've got lots of potential uses, and I think this is the thing, as a, probably as an organisation, I mean, we're, we're relatively new to Limousin New Zealand, um, but there's, there's, there's huge potential. They have um, tremendous growth rate, good carcass, um, they're really good as a cross, um, especially on other beef breeds, but even in the dairy industry. Uh, again, going back to, back to England, um, Limousin is the main breed over dairy cattle, um, just for easy calving, and then you've got a good saleable calf at the end of it. And what about yield? Um, yeah, they, they grow. They're, I mean, our, our limos on this on this pasture will grow phenomenally well. But even on on uh, on hill country, um, you, you know, the, I think it's standard re recognised now that um, sixty percent um, um, with your carcass um, meat that you're getting, and and they grow quick. So yeah, I, I personally, I'm probably a bit one-eyed, but I can't fault them. <laughs> well, most, most dad breeders are pretty one-eyed yeah. about their stock. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have to be, don't you? You're passionate about what you do. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm not so one-eyed that I don't look at other, other breeds. I mean, the, the calves that I buy in, I'm looking for Angus Cross and Hereford Cross because that is the recognised breeds of New Zealand. I'm not, uh, you know, you've, it's horses for courses. You like, like the old saying, you, when in Rome, do as Romans do. But when it comes to actual breeding, though, um, yeah, the, the limousin for me is, is, the, is the breed. Is it an up and coming breed? Do you see people getting into it? Yeah, I think so. I can definitely see a big future in it. The, we're heading in the right direction. Um, we've, we've got some excellent breeders locally 
Um, obviously, we're again being in Canterbury, we're very fortunate. We've we've got some good good local breeders. We've got Gary Kennett, the president, just around the corner from us here, um, and then there's Warwick James, um, excellent stock. They've got some great stock over 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 there as well. So um, yeah, we just recently brought a couple of his heifers. So plug for Warwick. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Not sure how to brighten up your backyard? Try Grow Sure Easy Flowers. All in one mix. Seed, feed, mulch. It's bloomin' easy. Be sure with Grow Sure from KiwiCare. Now, you've had a long history as far as goat farming is concerned. Yes, yes. Um, we've been... Uh, I was raised on a goat farm. Um, my mum and dad bred um, Tolkenbergs and Alpines back in England. And um, it's just something that I've enjoyed. I like the goats. Um, I married my husband, who was a Holstein man. And he, at the time, didn't want to milk any goats and breed them. But slowly as the years have gone on, so um, we've got back into breeding goats again. Getting back into breeding goats, that was because of a health issue. That's correct. Yeah, I have a few various health issues and I can't um, tolerate cow's milk. So um, I tried the goat's milk and realised that um, was better for me. So really it went from a hobby into a business? It did. Well, I brought home four goats, turned into ten goats, and then they got seriously into the breeding of it. And um, now we're milking 50 this year. And what's the market for the milk? At the moment, um, we're just rearing calves with it. Um, my husband does a lot of embryo transplants and calf um, rearing like that, so all the calves um, enjoy the goat's milk. And they, most calves do better on it as well than what they do the cow's milk. It's interesting the number of people who would prefer to buy goat's milk, but they can't find it in the supermarket. It's hard to find. Um, I think because the amount of cost that goes into um, to put, setting a factory room and there's a lot of rules and regulations, it puts a lot of people off. Um, and the, the big goat co-op on the North Island, it's all exported and very little of it is kept within the domestic market. Which is a shame because a lot of people would prefer to have some sort of milk but that when they're allergic to cow's milk. Yeah, um, yeah, it's hard. Um, yeah, we've contemplated looking at um, putting our own factory um, room in but it is the rules and regulations that put you off. There's a lot of loopholes. Um, sorry, there's, there's a lot of rules to be followed. and a lot, of, a lot of hoops to jump hoops, through. That's the word, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So where to, as, as the industry? I mean, is, is, are people looking at it really seriously now? Yes. Um, obviously, um, the amount of um, money you get for the literage of goat's milk um, is very appealing. Um, a lot of people um, are looking at it for the um, $7 a litre. Um, you, you can seem to be selling it for. So a lot of people doing a lot of research. There's a few breeders out there are doing their own cheeses as well. And um, yeah, they seem to be doing very well with it. With all due respect, goat farming was sort of looked down upon by dairy farmers, but that may change. Yes, um, I think there's a big demand um, for it's growing. Um, it's, and it's very, becoming very popular, especially with health um, issues like myself. People realize that it's a better alternative. You were stud breeding? Yes, yes, we stud breed Sarnans, which is the white goats, and Tockenbergs, which is the brown goats. So, big question, how many have you got now, considering you started with four? Okay, so um, our biggest bulk is Sarnans, so we'd have about 40 milking does, um, that are um, from pedigree down to um, being bred up for pedigree, and I have about 10-ish 
15 maybe, um, here at Toggenbergs, they're a bit more of a handful, so we keep those numbers a bit lower. And the Sarnans are the real placid, nice and easy goats to handle. 40 goats, you're milking by hand or do you have machines? A uh, machine. I would have very big hands if it was by, <laughs> if I did hand milking. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a bit expensive to set up. Um, yes, yes, so we bought um, a platform for them a few years ago and we bought um, a machine um, that milks um, four at a time. Um, but yeah, it was, it's worth doing um, and, you know, for, the, for the, uh, the milk. And of course you can monitor each animal and what they're producing. Yep, so we herd test, um, uh, LIC, um, we do all the solids um, testing for us and um, so we know exactly what each animal is doing. Um, at the moment we're averaging 4% um, fat and 3% protein and our top goat is producing just over 10% solids. So you'll be thrilled about that. Mm. Yeah, I was very, very pleased this year's um, herd test, our first one to get, it's brilliant. Yeah. Phil, you've repackaged the three and five K-line packs, why? Uh, look, it's all about providing people what they require for the areas that they've actually got to hand. Um, when you have a look at a lot of lifestyle areas, they're relatively small paddocks. So we're trying to give people the opportunity just to pick up a single pack and actually have their uh, requirements satisfied. There were some people who were sort of suggesting that the one hectare one didn't actually get into all the corners, but you fixed that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all about the hard decisions you have to make. Um, what we've done with the, with the bigger package is that we've increased the amount of pipe that's on there um, and that's about making sure that in fact we've got enough such that we can do exactly what we've suggested. Uh, the other pack still does roughly a hectare, um, just that this package you can just pick up one item and off you go uh, and it fits much better into a DIY type of um, opportunity I guess. So really the only decision is whether you need a three or a five pack? The decision is whether you have a three or a five and the three is going to fit really well in I can imagine a horse field or um, a situation where you have a smaller paddock and you're actually trying to um, just cover that well enough. Um, it comes with a number of nozzles, as in fact do all of the uh, farm packs. Um, they have three different nozzles in there, so you can adjust application rate and depth. Um, and they have a, a reasonably high performance non-sprinkler in them. DIY, how simple is it to get the whole thing up and running? Well, basically anybody that can um, screw a thread together or drill a hole actually has the ability to do the job. And there's stuff that we've got in there that assists people along that process. Uh, we've got a manual that covers uh, all of the what's in the pack, obviously, and exactly the detail that you need to put a whole system together. Now, some people don't like reading instruction manuals, but they'll watch a DVD. Uh, the reality is, actually, it also comes with the DVD. So the DVD talks about the basics that you need to know in the process one one to ten of how you would actually put all of that together. So what do you actually get when you buy the pack? You get, uh, whether it's a three or a five, obviously the appropriate number of pods to go with that. Uh, you also get, in the three pod circumstance, you get 66 metres of um, K-pipe. Now the K-pipe is specially made for K-line. Uh, and the compromise um, there or the requirement for that and specification is something that is uh, flexible, uh, yet tough enough to actually take the rigours of being shifted. Because in a, an irrigation sense, many, many systems, actually the product's static. It's not shifted, it's not moved. K-Line really does test the rigour of, of materials in some regard. Uh, we've also, in K-Pipe, put a, a clear stripe along the top uh, and often people will actually align that to the top of the pipe just to make sure that there are no twists actually in the pipeline. Because if it twists and you start moving it, the pods will tend to roll over. So we're trying to avoid that. So we want them all uh, above. Um, and then in the five pack, effectively you get the same sort of arrangement, only more. So rather than 66 metres, we've got 116 metres. 
uh, or in the standard farm pack, 100 metres. And you've even got the right size drill bit. There's a drill bit in there uh, with a collar to actually stop you drilling right through the pipe, which um, clearly can be done and actually has been done, so we've tried to protect that. Um, it comes with a, a socket in there to do the um, uh, nuts up on the saddles. Um, the uh, nuts, in this case, are brass nuts screwing onto stainless steel, which means they don't gall, they don't lock, they, they actually smoothly screw down. Um, and uh, also a, a drill bit connector for uh, those things, just to make it easy. So basically, Phil, it's a cash and carry? It's, a, it's pretty much a cash and carry. So you would pick, pick up the uh, roll, um, take it out into your paddock and actually start installing it. And it's complete. Um, although I would recommend to watch the really good DVD at the start. Just to give you that final instruction. That's correct. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try Groshaw Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with Groshaw from KiwiCare. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Holstein Frisians, you've had a long history with them. Yeah, um, grew, I've grew up with them um, from, from my early days when I was uh, born in Devon back in the UK. Um, always been around the Holstein black and white. So. Then you moved to New Zealand? Yeah, 2000 we moved over as a family um, and um, we, we moved up to Marlborough and um, we bought a, a dairy farm up there. The UK got a bit claustrophobic? Yeah, well, it was quite depressing actually during the 90s. Um, I was um, left school in the mid 90s and then went to college, went to Dutchy College and did a um, up to level four agriculture and um, it was there was just no future. Um, we'd been hit by a succession of um, negative stories in the press, there was the BSE scandal and then and that was just prior to us moving out the next thing was a foot and mouth so it, it wasn't getting any better over there that's for sure. UK daring very intensive compared to New Zealand numbers wise? Um, yeah it, there's, there's um, you get a lot of lot more farms um, where I grew up in the southwest there was there was um, it was still quite traditional in, in many ways there was um, small dairy farms but it's change changing rapidly yeah, the whole pitch has changed. And now you are here on the peninsula, or almost on the peninsula by Lake Ellesmere, and you're doing stud breeding. Yeah, yeah, that, that's our, that's our, as a family, we've, we've had a love for, for breeding pedigrees. Um, like I say, I grew up with um, Holstein. Um, I've always been associated with Limousin cattle as well. And, 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 and my wife, she grew up on a, on a small um, goat farm over in, in Kent. So yeah, we've, we've always had a, a love for the, the pedigrees. Tell me about your, your stock, because you'd be very picky. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we was up in Marlborough, I had a, it, was, it was basically a, a, a smallish commercial farm, but I couldn't be too picky, because you, you had to sort of get the milk in the vat. We had contracts to supply with town, town supply with Fonterra. Um, but now we've got the luxury of just being able to be really choosy. Um, I've basically, in a, in a way, started from scratch, really. Um, so we've, we're very fortunate in, in Canterbury in this area. We've got some of the best breeders um, right on our doorstep. Um, to name a few, we've got like Geddes's and, and uh, the Stewarts as well, and then a bit further down um, with the uh, uh, Fairview. So yeah, very fortunate to have some very good breeders locally. And you're not selling the milk? No, no. Um, it's actually nice having a break from, from not having that pressure of, of having to meet all the criteria and the regulation. So uh, not saying that that won't ever happen again. We, I, I, I'll never say never to anything, but at the moment we're just really enjoying concentrating on the breeding and um, I'm buying in lots of uh, beef cross calves and obviously rearing pedigree calves and that's that's what we're concentrating on at the moment. Ah, so that's how you pay the grocer. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. Yeah, we, we downsize, so we, we've been able to come onto the farm without massive overheads, and that's obviously the key to it. Um, the, the farm we had in Marlborough was, was substantial. It was about 1,000 acres, um, and we've come down to a, a farm here that's we're farming about 170 acres here. So it's a lot smaller, but um, we're, we're more hands-on with the stock. And are, are you yet selling? any of your Holsteins? No, no, not yet. Like I say, we're still very early days. So I'm just, um, like I say, very cherry picking a few. I've, I've, we brought a few from the, um, over the recent years from the Canterbury collection sale and just privately as well. Um, but um, that's not the main aim. The main aim is I'm only milking a handful. I, I, I just would like to be milking good quality cattle. That's, that's, that's my aim is I don't want numbers. I just want a few that milk very well. And yeah, in the future, if we can get a good, a good heifer that can uh, meet the criteria, then absolutely, that's a bonus. And I guess there must be some very good sires that you can buy the semen off. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very careful who, who I buy from. We've got some excellent reps that we do with locally, various different companies. Um, but um, yeah, we, there's certain traits that I look for. Um, we, we want good framed cows that milk well, look good. Um, longevity is a thing that I'm, I'm very keen on. I'm not, not keen on cows that produce oodles and then tail off. Um, in their relatively young years, so I want a cow that will do the distance, and um, and and yeah, ultimately um, the Eat top cattle. Yeah, we, yeah, basically small small numbers, but quality. Embryo transplants. Are you looking at that? Yeah, we've already, already done some of that. Yeah, we um, we work closely with one of the the chaps who's based up in the Hawkes Bay. Um, again, because we're only small numbers, we tie in with some of the local breeders, so we tend to work around like like the Geddeses and that when they're doing doing some flushes we'll work in with them and, and um, we're always keen to get two or three in and uh, do some embryos but yeah we've got um, just behind you here we've got an embryo a uh, couple of embryo calves that were born just this year. So tell me a wee bit about the family business because it almost started by accident. Yes well he, uh, he started the company in 1932 he was working for New Zealand Farmers Co-op and he was an agent on the road he had a car and uh, New Zealand Farmers Co-op used to lend money to farmers and um, I think it's in 1932 on New Year's Eve he was asked to uh, go to a farm in Lowburn and uh, uh, repossess the farm and the farmer uh, had four children and of course over time he'd become friendly with the farmer and his clients that he dealt with and he got halfway to Lowburn and he realised that he, he couldn't do it so he returned to Rangiora and put the keys on the, the manager of the Farmers Co-op desk and said, sorry, I'm, I'm not doing it. So of course he was instantly fired and then he had to go home and explain to my grandmother that he uh, had been fired in the middle of the depression and she was very, very worried, you know, how they were going to continue. So anyway, after that he got a, got a painting job as uh, my, my grandmother's uh, uncle was the mayor of Rangiora at the time and he said, well, you can paint my house. So he did that and he earned 50 pounds doing that and then he lent another, borrowed another 50 pounds from the mayor and he started to do city seats. Then from then on he used his personality to, to build up his client list? Yes he did, he was a charismatic uh, chap and well liked in the community and uh, he started uh, with an oat crusher on the, actually exactly where you're standing now Rob and um, the premises across the road was a um, a livery stable and farmers would come to Rangiora on a Friday and uh, to, for, to a stock sale in the middle of Rangiora and they'd leave their horses in the building across the road that we can see from here and bring him a bag of oats to crush and that's how he started. And then he got into seeds? Yes, yes, a short time after he, he became involved in, particularly in the wheat industry and he traded, traded wheat and then uh, ryegrass and clover. And so the next uh, uh, thing to happen, he, he purchased a seed cleaning machine from Mr. Andrews of Andrews and Bevan. He always insisted that he bought his machinery from Mr. Andrews, who used to come out on the train from Christchurch wearing a tweed jacket and a tweed hat. And my grandfather always enjoyed his company. They were really hard, but wonderful times, weren't they? They were, and it, it's quite nice for me, even today, you know, some of my older clients still remember my grandfather and talk about um, some of his wit and uh, trading that they did with my grandfather. Tell me a bit about the story about the bad weather. Yes, yes, well the, a client of ours uh, who's still a client today at Lowburn told me once that um, his uh, fa grandfather came to Rangiora uh, to sell ryegrass to my grandfather. He came on his push bike 
and uh, during the transaction it started to pour with rain, a southerly hit, and my grandfather said, oh, you can't possibly bike back to Lowburn. So he put, uh, put this chap's uh, bike in the back of the car and, and took him back to Lowburn, and the family still remembers that kindness to this day. Isn't it wonderful, that loyalty? Yes, we have got some very loyal clients, and we've got a, a number of clients that have been dealing with us for three generations. It's quite nice for me that I've you know, had the link with my grandfather. He was able to tell me about the start of the company, and we've still got areas of the company that um, were here when he first started, and that the, at the right height for a dray to back into and unload seed and we've still some of those areas still exist in the company today. Since then you've come a long way but very slowly. Yes we have, yes we're not uh, we're not fast out of the blocks but we uh, yeah today we employ a staff of somewhere about 50 and we're on two sites, we're on a two and a half hectare site here in the middle of Rangiora and we've got a one and a half hectare site uh, at Ashburton. There's four seed cleaning machines at Ashburton and there's two here in Rangiora. And you've got people on the road? We've got ten agronomists today visiting farmers uh, from Southland to um, Blenheim. And I guess you also use other merchants? Yes, a lot of our products are sold through other merchants, um, particularly our milling wheat varieties, our barley varieties. And we're starting to develop a portfolio of forage uh, seed which has been very well received by the industry. But small steps. Yes, yes, as I say, we just take things quietly, Rob, and don't get too ahead of ourselves. Even during your time, though, Vincent, the times have changed within the industry. Yes, well, that, yes, certainly. Um, you know, farming's a lot different today to, to what it was, and, you know, when my grandfather started, when everything was horse-drawn. Um, and also, you know, there's been a lot of improvements in our own industry and in particularly in the change changeover from um, bags to bulk in the in the 1970s, and I can I I was working here at that time as a small boy, and I certainly remember that change. Yeah, I do. I used to work on headers in a cloud of dust. <laughs> Pretty tough times. Well, well, they were tough old days, but I must say, from the point of view of working in the store, I thoroughly enjoyed um, you know working with um, the, the the gang of men that we had at that time, and. Uh, stacking, you know, I think I'd probably be the youngest person that knows how to stack seed uh, in a stack. And it was a lot of fun, and actually it was a lot of teamwork and thoroughly enjoyable. And it's still fun, isn't it, working within your community? Yes, well it is, yes. And actually my, um, I've got a 14-year-old boy and a 20-year-old 20, 20 girl, and they both work here in the holidays. And so they're probably doing similar things now to what, uh, to what I did when I was a, a child, but... Um, you know, it's probably just a little bit less uh, labour intensive. I guess times have changed with computerisation? Well, I guess it has, Rob. Um, it's not something that i not really my strong suit, I'd have to say. I sort of, just sort of missed out on that era. But um, yes, we're definitely um, finding that um, um, you know, our, keeping track of our stock uh, and um, yeah, our processes are definitely smoothed by computerisation. We're, we're, at the moment, we're undertaking a a large scale um, project to you know, bring our computer systems up to date. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try Growsure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with Growsure from KiwiCare. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. 
Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Not sure how to brighten up your backyard? Try Grow Sure Easy Flowers, all in one mix. Seed, feed, mulch. It's blooming easy. Be sure with Grow Sure from KiwiCare. Richard, grass grubs, we've got trouble looming because we're having some of the tools taken away. Yes, the organophosphate insecticides which we've used for a long time to control grass grub are slowly being phased out of the market. So growers this year noticing with the removal of uh, forate uh, from the market and in about the next decade we'll lose uh, the, the other key grass grub uh, control mechanism in diazinon. Uh, that will leave us one registered uh, organophosphate for grass grub control. Hence far uh, getting very involved with finding out other solutions. Yeah, we were quite worried. This is uh, one of our biggest pests, uh, especially during the establishment phase of, of a lot of uh, crops. So we've got a, yeah, a decade or so to um, come up with uh, alternative options for control. So what sort of things are you looking at? Well, there's other families of chemistry we can look at. So there's a neonicotinoid family, but that also uh, globally has a, has a few issues around use, in this, especially in uh, spring sown cropping. Uh, but the grass grub is predominantly a pest of winter crops and crops that don't necessarily flower. So we have a floral attraction uh, to honeybees. So we've got uh, looking into other... Um, microorganisms, I guess you call them, uh, biopesticides that could be used to control the grass grub. So there, there's been two or three identified and now it's a matter of trying to uh, implement those into some form of commercial uh, and viable uh, option. Because you can't always just use a heavy roller, Richard. No, there are very important con uh, cultural methods that should be thought about too. But, and a heavy roller can be quite effective, especially if it can disturb soil and, and actually cause a, a bit of a grating effect of, of soil particles next to each other. Uh, treating can be quite useful too. Um, but no, a heavy roller is okay if you can do it, but it's only going to get grubs in the top uh, layer of soil and they might be spread through the top 20 centimetres of, of topsoil. And they do go down though, don't they? They do. Uh, they fluctuate in their depth. Uh, they might uh, start off at about 10 centimetres and come up to two or three, so we can uh, a lot easier to control when they're in that, that uh, third instar phase in the, in the winter time, but you may not be able to heavy roll in winter because it's too wet. And then uh, later in the season when they stop feeding, they'll head back down to maybe 20 centimetres of depth, uh, which you know, they can be tricky to control. How did we end up with a two-year one? So the grass grub life cycle starts off as an egg in uh, summer and then they feed and slowly grow from first instars to second instar in sort of March and third instars might, might occur also in March, they slowly get bigger. If they run out of food uh, they'll turn and they'll go into diapause or a, um, a period of uh, non-feeding and they, that will drift through into um, the next season. So they need chilling before they can pupate into an adult and if they're not big enough or don't have enough fat they will uh, sit dormant and then uh, feed and they won't pupate till the following season. So they can cause damage in, uh, in springtime if they sit dormant through winter, start feeding again in spring, then pupate the following spring. Yeah, that's a dangerous sort of a thing because you know, you're planting a whole lot of spring crops and now they're waiting. That's right, and if you leave a paddock that doesn't have enough uh, living root uh, turnover in, in for, for them to feed on through the winter, uh, then they're just sitting there waiting for you to plant that crop. So having uh, having something growing through the through the crop uh, through the paddock, sorry, in the in the winter gives you a little bit of protection in the spring. Uh, likewise, it can give you protection if you delay planting uh, by actually getting them fatter and closer to pupation or stopping their, their feeding cycle. The pressure on different crops, like for example, carrot. Yeah, when you're planting uh, crops with low plant numbers, if you've only got 50 or, or 60 uh, plants per square metre and then you've got two or 400 grass grub per square metre, uh, grass grub larvae per square metre, then the pressure's immense. And a crop like carrots that's in the ground for uh, 12 to 14 months, uh, there's a lot of disease uh, 
pressures that are in the soil that a, a little bit of feeding damage can then then uh, leave you leave you prone to. Uh, crops like wheat and and so forth, where we plant 200 odd plants a square metre, uh, especially in the winter time and into spring, not quite as vulnerable, but if they're planted in the autumn and there's good numbers and they don't get big enough to handle the root feeding un uh, underneath in the, in the winter time, then they can be lost as well. So <clears throat> the pressure's really on? Yeah, yeah, the pressure's on, uh, on us and, uh, and the industry as a whole to uh, come up with sustainable uh, options for, for controlling grass grub in the next 10 years. Funding? Funding. Uh, there's a, there is government funding at the moment for the biopesticides uh, aspect of, of work uh, that, that's being uh, shared through uh, CRIs. Uh, the chemical companies are looking at alternatives, uh, <laughs> but this uh, is only really a unique New Zealand uh, pest, so uh, the government, uh, the, sorry, the chemical uh, funding's uh, probably more limited compared with a global uh, issue. So I guess your findings, Richard, will be on the FAR website? Yes, uh, we've, we've, there's, uh, there's at least two or three years worth of uh, research already published on the, on the FAR website as uh, arable updates. And we're in the process of publishing some of that for peer review, uh, so that'll end up in, in some journal articles as well. You're confident, aren't you, that, that you can keep on top of the pesky little devils? Uh, we have to. Uh, there's no option, otherwise we lose an industry. Uh, especially the small seeds industry of, of ryegrass and, and white clover. Uh, so there's no option, we have to, have to keep, keep on top of them. I'm Rob Coe Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme, but it will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.